Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. And I've been excited through this series and I pray that something I've shared or something that God has spoken to you uh, through this series has been impactful for you um, as much as it's been impactful for me and the, what I'm learning and what I'm experiencing and what I'm growing in. You know, oftentimes when I'm speaking, it's things I'm speaking from my own heart of places where I know God is working on me and the things that I've gone through and the things that God is uh, using uh, in me. And so I uh, just want to give a quick recap um, of this series So far, on week one, we had a message called The Lesson of God's Story. And we took, uh, we took a look at how easily we can get off track when it comes to actually walking the right direction, how easily we can get lost, um, and how easily uh, that can just happen. And, and the real focus of that message was that we need to make God the main character of our story, that he is the one who's the author, he's the one who's the, who's the narrator of our story. And then uh, two weeks ago, I shared a message called Strong People. And we're talking about how Samson was an incredibly strong man, but he had incredibly weak self-control, like I think a lot of us as humans have. And we looked at some of the attitudes that he had that we also have that can lead us to a big fall. And then last week, we had a message called Small Steps and how in Samson's life, the failures he had in his life, the fall that he had, didn't happen in a moment. It was small steps that took to that moment. Uh, where he lost his strength. Didn't it just happen in a moment? It's the same for us, how in our lives, it's not oftentimes our downfall doesn't happen in an instant. It happens over time as we take small steps in the wrong direction. And I want to encourage you, if you've missed any of these messages, I, I want to encourage you to go back and watch them in, in, on our YouTube page. And I believe that this series has been powerful so far, but today is my favorite message of this series uh, because today's message is called Overcoming Failure overcoming failure. And I know when I say that word failure, I think for a lot of us, we have different relationships with the word failure. You know, some of us, when we look back, all we can see is failure after failure, or maybe even right now in our lives, we're looking at something that we're failing in, maybe as parents or as employees or, or, or as husbands and wives, maybe we're failing in a moment. We have this interesting relationship with this word failure. And I think so many of us, We've gotten trapped or we've gotten caught up in this belief that we are a failure because we failed. And as human beings, of course, if we look at as us as humans, failure is a part of our story. If you read through scripture, if you read through history, we just see failures and failures. But also we see God moving, we see victories and victories. And I think so many of us, failure brings up interesting emotions. And my prayer today is that we'll be able to learn how to overcome failure in our life in the best way possible. Don't include this series today on Samson. We can realize, I pray that we can realize and understand that failure, failure, it did follow Samson wherever he went to read through it, but it wasn't who he was. Samson wasn't a failure. If you go back to the end of the story, which we're going to get to, Samson had a lot of failures, but that did not make him a failure. And so when we left off this story last week, if you remember, we see Samson, he's at rock bottom. He's just had his hair cut. He, it, it says, the saddest verse in the story, right, it says that he didn't realize that the strength of God had already left him. That God had already left him. The Lord had left him. And that's where we find Samson. He's been tied up. He's had his eyes taken out. This is the rock bottom for this man. This man who was now, uh, we, find, we found him grinding grain in the prison. A man who had just earlier carried an entire gate on his back up a hill is now in a prison grinding grain and he doesn't even have his eyes anymore. This is a big fall off from where he was to where he is now. And in week one, uh, the first message we, we, I spoke, we mentioned that Samson is, is mentioned alongside the heroes of the Bible in Hebrews. He's mentioned among the greats, the, the heroes, the people we look to as men. Those people followed God's voice. Those people went. We see people like Noah and Abel. We see David and Abraham and Moses and Gideon. And then we see Samson. 
Right? It's kind of like looking up at the rafters at Rogers Place and we see Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier and Paul Coffey and Glenn Anderson and Jack Campbell. <laughs> so... If you don't get that, that joke, Jack Campbell has been like not as good as we hoped he would be. So he's not in the rafters at Rogers Place. But one thing kind of doesn't fit in, right? This guy, we look at his life, uh, so many things in his life that, that were failures. You know, I think, and, and I've been seeing this for a long time, and, and maybe this is you, but I think the number one thing holding people back from doing the things that God has called them to do is not a lack of resource or a lack of talent or a lack of ability. What I think the biggest thing holding people back is a failure in their past that they have yet to overcome. I don't think it's a lack of ability. I don't think it's a lack of resource. Those are the things that we can see naturally. But I think sometimes the biggest thing holding us back from the things God has called us to do, from living the life that God has called us to live, is not that we don't have the resources to do it, not that we don't have the talent to do it, but that we actually had a failure in our past, and it's still affecting us today. And we don't have this ability to overcome our biggest failure. There's so much shame that's come because of a failure we've had in our past. And I think we can all look back on moments where we've had a big failure. A moment maybe in our marriage. Or a moment maybe at work. Or a moment with our children. Or, or a moment with our spouse. And, and this moment of failure is still in our minds. And it's not allowing us to go forward. And I think that the greatest fear that a lot of us have, maybe even humanity has, is failure. We're afraid of failure. We don't want to be failures. We don't want to be known for the things that we didn't do well. And oftentimes the things that is our greatest failure become our biggest regret. The, thing, the things we did then and now, now we're like, oh, I wish I didn't do that because I can't go forward. And I think that for a lot of us men especially, I think failure can be extremely difficult for, difficult for us to overcome. Why? And I think it's because for a lot of men, we find our value in our accomplishments, right? What we do, how we accomplish. That's how we find a lot of our value. Because the value comes from the things that we do well and the things that we don't do well. And we don't like to have failure in our life because it cuts us right to the core. Because most men, our value comes from our accomplishments. And it comes as a big blow for us because it shows us how weak we are. How, 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 how we wish it was one way, but we did the wrong thing. And, and we, we feel so hurt by this. And then when you look at women, a lot, for, for a lot of women, their value comes from relationships. This is kind of as they've studied the human minds. And you can see this clearly when women ask each other to go to the bathroom with them. Now, for men, we don't even comprehend how I would invite someone to come to the bathroom with me. Because in the men's bathroom, we have etiquette that we have to follow. Now, I'm going to share this with you because this is the truth for all of us men out there. And I don't know if I've ever read it anywhere, but this is true. If you walk in to the washroom and there's a lot of urinals, you don't stand right beside somebody else. That's the last thing you want to do. And if you have to do that, you are focused straight ahead and you never look down. That's the rule. Always just look forward. This is what it's like for men. But I see for women and for men, we have different things that we find our value in. And to be honest, we're finding them in the wrong things. If we're finding our value in our accomplishments or in our relationships, you know what's going to happen is eventually they're going to fail us because our value is coming from the wrong place. We have to find our value from the right thing and the right person. Because what the enemy tries to do is that because we failed, he says, you're a failure. The enemy tries to trick us that because, yes, we had something that we did that was wrong. We, we made a mistake. We had a failure. The enemy's trying to tell you that's who you are. You are a failure. Look what you did. Look at the things in your life that shouldn't be there. Look at you. You're a failure. But if we read through Scripture and if we look through history, we can know and understand that this isn't true at all. That just because you had a failure, that doesn't make you a failure. And do you know what's fascinating? You read through scripture and then you read through that Hebrews chapter. 
God often used people who were available and those who were willing to get back up when they fell. The ones that, yes, they had their failure, but they were able to get back up and keep on going. Do you have that ability in your life that when you fall, you can get back up? Are you willing to get back up? And I want to leave, like one thought I want you to know today is, is if I want you to truly understand this, that before you leave, is that a failure is an event, it's never a person. And if you read through the story of Judges, which you're going to go through right now, you're going to see this happen in Judges chapter 16, verse 23. This is right after Samson's been tied up. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God. And to celebrate saying our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Now this assembly would have taken place at their temple. And the temple was more like a coliseum where there was these two uh, pillars that kind of held up the roof. And what would happen is as people, thousands of people would gather on this roof and they'd watch what was happening below. This was kind of as they have studied this. And then these pillars were about six feet apart and would hold up the structure so that people could stand and watch what was happening. And they're celebrating, right? They're celebrating. Why? Because Samson, the, guys that, the guy that's been wreaking havoc on them, who's been doing things that they wish wouldn't happen, who's been tying foxes together and lighting them on fire, they finally caught Samson. And he, they've taken out his eyes. They, they're humiliating him because he's been humiliating them. And they, he's in this moment. They're celebrating this fact. And in Judges, verse, uh, verse 25 says this, while they were in high spirits, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. And, when they, and they stood him among the pillars. Now I think we often feel this same way. That when we fail, we feel like there's an audience watching our failure happen in front of them. We feel like people are laughing at us or mocking us because we feel like they know what's going on. And sometimes our failure is very public and other times our failure is very private. And we, even though the shame inside of us makes us feel that everyone who sees us sees it and that's all that they see. It's an obvious sign. People are laughing at us and making fun of us and this can cut us right to the core. Now what I want to do is I want to give us two responses to failure that we often have as humans. And number one, the m- number one thing that we have as a response to failure, number one is regret. This is one of the most um, field emotions, the emotions that we feel the most is regret as humans. One of the most. It's, I think it's love and then regret is number two. We look back at our failure and, and regret swells up inside of us and it takes over. And what, what regret does is it causes us to do one of two things. It either causes a lot of shame in our life, or do you know what else regret will do? It offers us a lot of blame in our life. A lot of shame, which is the internal feelings of shame. And then also a lot of us, what we do, we don't feel the shame. We just start to blame everything else and blame, blame the circumstance and blame the things happening around us. When, when we have a failure, it's like, it's your fault, not mine. I did everything right. It's your fault. It's their fault. It's my wife's fault. It's my kid's fault. Inwardly, we feel shame. Look what I did. I can't believe I, I, I could be so stupid. How could I do that? No one ever loved me again. Look how bad I am. And then what happens is we go to blame, which is we play the victim. I'm only here because of what they did. She wasn't meeting my needs, so it's her fault. It's the salesman's fault. I didn't do anything wrong. It's my child's fault. They just don't listen. Samson could have done this, right? It's Delilah's fault. She tricked me. It's that prostitute's fault. It, it's, it's their fault. It's her fault. It's her fault. We do this as people. I think this is so tough for a lot of us because what happens is rather than being the warriors God has called us to be, what we've done is we've become whiners. Where, where we whine about the circumstance. We whine about what's going on. And what happens is that when this is a part of our life, we actually lose a lot of our strength because we're looking, it's everybody else's fault. And we don't look inside to realize the, the responsibility that we have and we had in those moments as well. We see people who go from relationship to relationship and it's always their fault. 
but they never look inward. And I want to tell you, if that's where you're at, you are not a failure. You are more than a conqueror. Don't get stuck in that moment. Regret focuses on our past. And what happens is if we regret, it gets us nowhere because all our energy is being spent in shame or blame. Our past is something we learn from. It's not supposed to be somewhere we live. It's something that we can learn from. We can learn from our mistakes. We can learn from our failures. We can learn from the moments that, that, that have been really difficult. But that's not where we're supposed to live. Because we have another option when it comes to failure. And that option is this, is repentance. Rather than regret, we can step out in repentance. And what repentance means is to turn around. We talked a little bit about it last week, to turn around. It focuses on change and leads us toward transformation. Rather than leading us nowhere like regret, repentance leads us towards transformation and to change in our life. That when, you know, the Bible says that it will become a new creation. This is this moment where we can step and we can turn around and start going back to the places we know we're supposed to be. And it's never too late to turn around. See, Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says this, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And he may send the Messiah who is appointed for you, even Jesus. Turn, we gotta turn around. And what comes when we repent? What comes when we turn around? What comes is this refreshing that a lot of us are so desperate for because our failures are still keeping us up at night today for year after year and week after week after week. We need a moment of peace and refreshing. We need it in our life. And how do we get this? Is by turning around, running back into our Father's arms. See, regret, again, it, it focuses so much on the past and repentance focuses on the future. So some of us, we spent all of our energy, all of our time focusing on what happened rather than saying, okay, how can I learn and how can I repent? How can I turn around and start going back to the best place? We have the ability to create a better future by repenting and going forward, not living in the past with our shame and our blame. And the question is, why is it so hard to turn around? That's a big question. Why is it that turning around or making the right choice is so hard? What, why does this happen? It's because the journey of failure is downhill. You ever try and roll a, a, a ball down a hill? It can go quick. You know, to be honest, getting into debt is, can be very easy. And to be honest, getting into debt can kind of be fun too. Right? Because you have everything you want. And you just have to pay for it over, over time. But it can be easy to get into debt. But do you know what's hard is getting out of debt? Do you know what that takes? It takes work because the journey to overcoming is uphill. It's harder to, to go uphill than it is to go downhill. That's why it's hard to turn around because what happens is we turn around and we see how much work it's going to be to actually get there. We're going to see that it's not going to be this easy road necessarily to actually overcome our failure. So we see the amount of work it's going to be, the conversations we're going to have to have with our spouse, the healing, the counseling we're going to need to receive. And that's a lot of work. But I think for some of us, we're willing to put in the work at work. We're willing to go uphill for the promotion. We're willing to do it at work. But when it comes to the most important pieces of our lives, our marriages or our relationships with our kids, the work seems like it's going to be too much. It seems like it's going to be too much work to actually start that journey back up the hill. We feel like, no, it's, I'm just going to put in the work at, at work. I'm not going to do it at home. It's too hard. Overcoming is an uphill battle, and it's not always easy. Those of us who have, who have had moments where we failed, but we've overcome it, we know how much work it can be. But do you know what, that, that, that story, that journey of turning around, walking back up the hill, turns into powerful testimonies. And I know we have powerful testimonies in, in the house today. Of people who have failed, but guess what, they didn't give up. They got back up, and they kept on going. In Judges 16, verse 26, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple. 
so that I may lean against them. It's kind of an interesting request. Put me up against the pillars. Now, if you know the story, you know kind of what this leads to, but he's, he's like, put me up against the pillars. And then in verse 28, this is so powerful. The most important verse, I think, in, in, this, in the story of redemption is this. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, sovereign Lord. And that word Lord there, he's actually using the word Yahweh, which is the same word that, they, that God gave to Moses when he delivered the Israelites. Yahweh. He says, sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Remember me. Now, I can imagine in, in this moment, if, if you've had a moment like that where you're in your deepest, darkest moment and it's this kind of last resort almost to cry out and say, God, remember me. But what I think Samson remembered in this moment was that he served a God who forgives. That he serves a God who loves, who, who is who's strong, who's capable. The same God who gave him the strength to get, to get the line. That same God who gave him the strength to do all these things. He still was available. All he had to do was turn around. One more time, give me the strength. One more time. And I think some of us today, that might be the prayer that we need to pray that same prayer. Because what's happening is we're seeing so much moments, moment after moment, where we just keep falling down and we can't get back up. And we need to pray this prayer, Lord, strengthen me one last time. Give me the strength to overcome this. Give me the strength that I need one more time. That's his prayer, once more. And then what he does is he places his hands on the pillars, right? The one on the left and one on the right. He places his hands there. I think he did this literally, but I also think there's this, there's this significance in this, and I think we need to grasp this. Is there's two pillars available to us as well to hold on to in our weakest moment. Two pillars. Pillar number one is this I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. You know, we read through the Bible, we read through Scripture, and we see this come out so often. I'm forgiven. Yet I think for a lot of us, it's hard to understand why such a good God would forgive some of the things that we've done in our lives. It's so important for us to understand more than anything else, you are forgiven. And unless we can reach out and understand and grab this pillar and know that I am forgiven, we're never going to get to a moment where we can overcome our failure because we don't realize that Jesus came and he died to forgive me. The most important part of Jesus and the most important part of, of what we believe as followers of Jesus is that he came and died so that I can be forgiven. We have to understand the transformational power of God's deep, deep love for us. I am forgiven. And then the second pillar is this, is that God can strengthen me again. You might be sitting here today and be like, I'm so weak. I keep falling into the traps over and over and over again. I've tried to turn around and, and I keep going right back. The things in my life that are holding me back, I, I, I'm so weak. Maybe you've lost your strength. But we serve a God who will strengthen you again. Your journey, your story is not over. No matter how far away we go, no matter the things that we do, he's always there and he'll say, I'll strengthen you one more time. I'll meet you in your darkest moment and he will give strength to us again. And this is how the story ends. Judges 16, verse 29 to 30. And Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. 
And it ends with thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Now I think this, there's a lot of significance in this is because I think for some of us, we believe that our past, the things we did in our past, the good things, that's the pinnacle of our life. We think, yeah, oh, you know, I did that. That's the best thing I ever did. That's, nothing's gonna top that. But then we've fallen. When we pray, God, give me the strength one more time. I believe that, that the best for you is still ahead of you. The things that God still wants to do inside of you. No matter the failure you've had, like all of us have had as, as people, we've all had failures. But again, that doesn't make us a failure. What it means is that we can put our hands and realize I'm forgiven and God will strengthen me again. And then we have to push with all our might. Everything we have inside of us, it's not going to be easy. It's not easy to overcome addiction. It's not. Those of us who have family and friends who have struggled with addiction, it's not easy to overcome it. But it's possible. It's possible. It's possible to have healing come to your marriage. It's possible. Is it easy? No. But it's possible. It's an uphill battle. But I believe that the best is yet to come. Those of us whose marriages, maybe our marriages are struggling. Don't give up. Don't give up. Do you understand that I am forgiven? Once you understand that, and maybe you've had a moment where you've experienced that in a real way, that, that changes you. When you realize that I am forgiven, it changes you. But it also changes us when we realize that God can strengthen us again. See, God did more with Samson in his final moment than everything else in his life. You know, if we're still breathing, I've said this before, he's not done with us. There's more. You might look at your situation now and be like, God, I'm not seeing it though, right? I'm not seeing it. Things are in shambles. You got to pray that prayer, Lord, give me the strength today. Give me the strength to keep on fighting for my marriage. Give me the strength to keep on fighting for my kids. Give me the strength to keep on praying for my family. Give me the strength to say no to the things I need to say no to. To yes to the right things. Give me the strength and the courage I need. To these two pillars, I am forgiven. And God can strengthen me again. Have this ability to catapult us or move us into the most beautiful places ever of healing and life and joy. And if we're willing to use all our might to hold on I believe that there's more to come for all of us you know some of us were, we're in situations where there's not a lot of people around us encouraging us saying you can do it not a lot of people who are fighting for us not a lot of people who believe in us but the beautiful thing is that even if we don't even if we don't believe, God still believes in you. He can still move you. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He, he knows and he wants to meet you there. He, he, he wants you. He forgives you. He wants to strengthen you. Our church believes in you and I believe in you. It's not going to be easy. But that's why we come together and we walk together and that's why we gather together so that we can stand together and overcome together. We're stronger together. Now maybe you're sitting here today and you can think of something in your life. You're like, yeah, that, this is the thing. But I want to encourage you, you know, our takeaway today is this, is what, what is God calling me to fight for right now that's uphill? I don't know what it is. It might be your marriage. 
It might be your relationship with your kids where you look and you're like, man, this is gonna be a lot of work. It might be debt. It might be joy. Some of us, we can't even remember the last time we felt real joy. It might be our mental health. It might be our anxiety. It might be our depression. It's gonna be an uphill battle and we don't know if we can keep going. What's God calling me to fight for that's uphill right now? I don't know what it is for you. and I think there's a lot of things that we got to fight for. It might not be easy. It might not be easy again to turn around. Sometimes it's a lot easier to live in regret sometimes because we're so much more comfortable in regret. We're so much more comfortable than we are in repentance because it's not easy.